Hey, look up! There's a meteor shower happening right now! Okay, not really. But I made you look. If you're a fan of full moons, there's one coming up very soon. On February 27th to be exact. I really hope this video comes out in time. The moon will be lit up right in front of our eyes because it will be located on the opposite side of the Earth, where the Sun is. It will help illuminate the moon, providing us with a night to remember. Take a good look at it. Doesn't it sort of resemble a huge snowball just hanging from the sky? Some native tribes in the northern hemisphere of our planet might have thought the same. That's why they used to call it the snow moon. You know, when it was big and full, like this. Okay, go ahead and grab a telescope now, because on the 9th and 10th of March, there are three planets that will line up for your aesthetical pleasure. Starting from top to bottom, you'll see Jupiter, then Saturn, and last, but surely not least, Mercury. Now, depending on how good your telescope is, and if you've even got one, chances are you'll see some details of these three planets. You adjust your telescope a bit, and there it is! Another planet. Almost like they're not thousands and thousands of miles away from each other. But that's not all. They'll be visible to the unaided eye, too. This means you won't even need a telescope. Well, you'll probably see them like this. Three bright white balls in the sky. Still astonishing, though. You'll need to be looking at the southeast around half an hour before the sun rises. And voila! There they are. In the mood for a relaxing shower? How about a meteor shower instead? This time, you can keep your telescope safely stored, and you don't need to worry if you miss one or two of these showers, as there are quite a few happening this year. They're pretty evenly spread out, too, and I don't mean the meteors. Those come close together. Grab your calendar and put a reminder on these months. You can choose from April, August, October, November, and December. Some months even have two showers instead of only one, like October and November. Choose the month and day that works for you. Just check your calendar again. If you don't mind it being a bit chilly, just wrap yourself up in a blanket and hop in the back of your pickup truck. Then, all you have to do is stare up and enjoy the sky all night long, waiting for the shower to happen. Or, if you like to work by the clock, set up an alarm to wake you up in the middle of the night. That works too. Mercury's coming right at you! Watch out! Ah, don't fret. It's still right up there. Just a bit closer than usual. That's because on the 17th of May, it'll be at its greatest eastern elongation. What this means is, it will be easier to observe. Right after sunset, point your eyes to the skies in the west and try to look for the planet. This happens again during the 4th of July, but this time you'll have to look to the east. You might need a compass. Start your celebrations early in the morning, just before the sun rises, with a gorgeous view of Mercury, and of course, a cup of coffee in your hand. If you still don't catch it then, try September 14th or October 25th. How about when the moon loses its natural white color? This happens just a few days after Mercury's first performance, on May 26th. It's called a total lunar eclipse. The moon will get gradually darker as if someone was dropping dark red paint on it, until it finally reaches this sort of rusty red color that you can see on the screen. Not all of us will be able to see this, unless you're on a cruise in the Pacific Ocean or in the calm fields of Eastern Asia. If you live next to the Tokyo Tower, you're in luck. It'll be visible throughout the whole of Japan. And if you happen to live in the western part of North America, you'll also be able to see the moon shapeshift. Well, not quite shapeshift. It's not going to turn into a wolf or anything. That only happens if you're a werewolf, which I definitely am not. So it's more like a color shift. Still, on the moon, picture a massive black hole. Well, this next astronomical event kind of resembles that. On June 10th, during the annular solar eclipse, the moon will be the furthest it ever gets from Earth. While it's doing this, it ends up covering most of the sun leaving just a bit of its curvature for us to see. If you happen to look at the sky during this time, what you'll see is a massive ring of light. Chances are you won't be able to tell that's the moon out there, since it'll be the same color as deep space, the absence of color, or just a very deep black. Oh, 
And that ring you're seeing? That's the sunlight. Okay, since we're talking about rings, I've got one for you. Saturn's ring. This planet is the full package. It's a planet, it has a ring, and get ready for this, it has 82 moons. It feels like every year a few new ones pop up out of nowhere. Anyway, during August 2nd, the planet will be at its closest point to Earth, and the Sun will help us catch a good sight of it by brightly illuminating it. Not only will it be brighter than it ever is during the whole year, but it will also be visible all night long. This is the time to get that telescope ready again. A medium-sized one should do the trick. That is, if you want to see its rings and some of its moons. The ones that shine the brightest. Another planet that's coming closer is Jupiter. This time on August 19th. The same thing that happened to Saturn will happen to it. The Sun will shine bright on its big planet face. The only difference is that this time, if you have a good pair of binoculars lying around, you'll be able to see the planet's four largest moons. Although they'll look like tiny dots, but now you know what they really are. Okay, so you've been thinking about those meteor showers I mentioned earlier. Well, this one is the best there is. It's called the Perseids Meteor Shower, and it almost looks like the sky is a pitching machine. Except it's pitching meteors. During this particular shower, you might even be able to observe up to 60 meteors per hour. They're very bright too. Look at them go! Zoom! Oh, there goes another one. The best days to get cozy, sit on the grass, and just lie there looking at the sky is during August 12th and 13th. Usually, when these two days come around, the sky's dark and clear. Perfect for a meteor shower. Picture a slightly red moon. That's called the partial lunar eclipse, and it happens during the 19th of November. This same red moon will get darker and darker as it moves through Earth's shadow. It won't be visible to everyone, though. Here's a globe. Let's mark the places where you can see this partial lunar eclipse. First, we got Eastern Eurasia, then Japan. The Pacific Ocean's included in this list, too. But unless you got a boat, you're likely not going to be there. Then we've got North America, Mexico, Central America, and lastly, some parts of Western South Africa. Grab a hold of your eclipse glasses and get ready for this last one. It's the last solar eclipse of the year. This one in particular is the best one to catch, as the moon will block the sun for almost two minutes. You'll be able to see the almost ghost-like sun's corona, also known as its outer atmosphere. The sad part is, you'll have to be in Antarctica or the South Atlantic. Eh, just be careful out there. I heard it gets a little chilly. Ah, Earth. The third rock from the sun. A blue planet. You get it. Its atmosphere is made up of around 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% argon, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. A nice balance for any living creatures to breathe. The weather here is also perfect for life to exist, unlike places like Saturn, Mercury, or any other celestial object in our solar system. We have the troposphere to thank for that. It's the densest part of the atmosphere on our planet and is 5 to 9 miles wide. It's the layer of the atmosphere that always affects our weather and secures the right conditions for life to exist and to have bodies of water. Earth is just sitting in its orbital path, minding its own business, revolving around the sun until, bam! Venus and Mars swoop in and spoil the fun. No one wants to leave poor Earth alone. These two relatively large celestial objects moving toward Earth will have dire consequences for our planet starting with changes in its orbiting trajectory path. The planet's orbits in the solar system have to maintain the right balance so that nothing goes haywire. Of course, if any large object approaches Earth, it would throw our orbiting path off course. The planets will revolve around each other, which will cause plenty of natural disasters on our lands. This will also affect our rotation timing, potentially slowing it down. Days will not flow, but drag by. Animals that rely on daytime will need to readjust their biological clocks. Nocturnal animals will also need to figure out how to cope with the long nights. Humans have adjusted pretty well to the 24 hours a day timing. Time itself is just a human construct to measure things. We'll have a tough time sleeping and adjusting to the stretched day. 
Marine animals rely on the natural current flow to migrate around the oceans. With Mars and Venus crashing the party, it looks like they will also need to find new paths. Birds migrating to other lands throughout the year will also be confused and not know what to do. In general, the Earth's temperature will rise, and massive heat waves and permanent climate changes will occur. This brings us to our next issue, the heat. The radical temperature rise will turn everything into a barren desert. It'll be summer all year long, especially if Venus is in the picture. Most of the planet will dry up and won't be suitable for growing crops. Venus is hot, I mean really hot. Even though it's not the closest planet to the Sun, it's still the hottest. The temperatures on Venus are close to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which will melt you like an ice cube. The lands on Venus are generally flat, probably due to the temperatures. It's mainly hot because its atmosphere is thick and traps the hazardous gases inside. If Venus inches its way towards us, it'll invite those gases to our atmosphere and compromise it. Mars, or the red planet as we know it, is very cold. That might stay the same if it starts rotating around us. It's also home to the largest dormant volcano in our solar system, which makes Mount Everest look like a tiny bush compared to a tree. With so much instability, it might just wake up one day and spew out molten lava. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, which makes the planet chilly. Its gravity is quite similar to ours. It's actually very cold and has ice caps in the poles covered with carbon dioxide. The same is true for Mercury. You can only last there as long as you can hold your breath and be in the sweet spot between the sunrise and sunset. The three planets orbiting each other will eventually collide. It's just a matter of time. And the moon, just hanging out like a fly on the wall, will be so insignificant that something will eventually throw it off course and another planet will capture it to its orbit. Or, in the most dire case, it will collide with one of the two intruding planets. Earth will experience extreme tidal waves like nothing before. The two new planets revolving around Earth will cause a major imbalance, making our gravity shift out of control. Each tidal wave will be bigger than the previous one and will cover the dry land. Plenty of little scattered islands in the oceans will be completely submerged. Coastal cities and towns will also be home to fish. Flat countries in general will need boats to get around. Dams and dikes won't be enough to stop the water from coming in. Everyone needs to move towards higher ground to escape the floods. With the climate getting hotter, the polar caps will melt like ice cream on a sweltering summer day and add to the water level rising. Within a few months, the whole Arctic will be nothing but liquid. But wait, there's more! The crust will wear out due to the instability of the Earth's surface and fluctuating gravity. The Earth's crust is mainly made up of oxygen, which means we're basically walking on air. We might experience more earthquakes than before, and dormant volcanoes will wake up from their deep slumber. The skies will be covered in ash, making flights impossible. No one can travel by sea or by air. Importing and exporting will become history. The overall climate will get hotter, just like in Venus. The three planets orbiting each other and their huge mass might even unintentionally welcome other planets and celestial bodies to join the party. So, what if Jupiter decided to turn up? Now, Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. To give you an idea, the Earth would be just the size of a grape if Jupiter were the size of a basketball. It also has the largest storm we can perceive. That's known as the Red Spot, a place twice the size of Earth that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for hundreds of years. Now, by the time you're done watching this video, you can expect the storm to still be going at it. Since the planet is huge, gravity must be quite strong here. It also has many moons, some of them of our little Earth. There will be no room for any proper space among the planets. Jupiter's moons will be thrown off course and latch onto other planets around. Some of the moons might collide with each other, causing massive debris to be displaced all over the place. The gravity of the planetary party will attract comets to enter the atmosphere, potentially crashing down on us. Oxygen levels will deplete, so the Earth's crust crumbling will continue. It'll rip open the ozone layer, causing heavy strokes of ultraviolet waves to enter our atmosphere. 
we won't be able to step outside for too long without some protective gear and oxygen tanks. Human civilization will change drastically. We'll all live in sheltered containers that will provide clean air and safe and filtered sun rays. The shelters will be sturdy enough to withstand frequent earthquakes. We will grow only enough crops to sustain ourselves until we leave the Earth. Since it'll only be a matter of time before the planets collide, the next step would be to create large rocket ships to fly us out of the Earth. With Mars, Venus, and Jupiter revolving close to us, it won't be easy to do so. All the space debris will be blocking us from exiting the space zone area. The only safe place outside this region will be many millions of miles away, where only single planets exist. They may or may not have the conditions to host life. But humans will have the technology to land just about anywhere with similar gravity and construct the right shelters. Eventually, Mars, Venus, Earth, and Jupiter will collide with each other and break like eggs. Like a big space omelet. Don't forget the moon's crashing and breaking in the mix, but we'll already be far, far away by then. Hopefully. You look up and see a bright orange flash in the sky. A bit later, you hear a boom so loud the window panes around you burst into pieces. And then you see it. A giant piece of space rock burning high above your head, heading for Earth. When it touches the surface, the explosion leaves behind an enormous crater. It's 12 miles deep and as wide as Lake Michigan. After that, three-quarters of all living organisms on our planet are on the edge of survival. This event took place about 66 million years ago. And the bright flash in the sky was the very asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. These days, people have many ways to protect themselves. Like, we could hide in bunkers deep underground and survive. Such bunkers would already come in handy, since there are many asteroids in the sky. And some of them are just waiting for their ticket to Earth to wreak some havoc. For example, the asteroid 1990 MU. In 2027, it'll come alarmingly close to our planet. Many people fear that Earth's gravitational pull will trap the rock, which is the size of two Brooklyn bridges. In this case, it'll start to move closer and eventually crash into the planet's surface. Such an impact would cause a shock wave that would be felt on other continents. Once the asteroid hit the ground, there would be an explosion. It'd be so bright, people would think a new sun appeared right here on Earth. The collision would release a huge amount of energy that would then turn into heat everything around the impact site would catch fire. And if the asteroid fell in the water, it would cause tsunami waves higher than the Empire State Building. Many coastal cities would be flooded. The dust that would rise after the explosion would cover the sun. The world would be plunged into darkness. If the dust stayed in the air long enough, the climate on the planet would change and Earth would start to freeze. If you think such a small meteorite can't cause serious damage, Look at the Chayabinsk meteor. It hit the Earth in the winter of 2013. When the space rock entered the atmosphere, people miles away heard a loud bang. The brightly burning object was approaching the surface at about 11 miles per second. Halfway through the flight, it split into several pieces. This caused several stronger shock waves. When the meteorites hit the ground, it caused a major earthquake. And the aftershock from the explosions shattered the windows of 5,000 buildings. People in six cities around the crash site felt the aftereffects of the fall. And this meteorite was only 60 feet wide. Fortunately, the asteroid 1990 MU will move past our planet. We'll be safe. Whew! But the next asteroid to approach Earth is going to be 3 miles wide. It's called 3122 Florence. If this giant hit our planet, it could wipe entire continents off the face of the Earth. In 2017, this space rock got awfully close to us. It could be seen in the sky even with a small telescope. Now, the next asteroid is the biggest one to worry about. 1999 JM8. It's about as wide as Manhattan. And it has an unnerving habit of approaching Earth a bit too close for everyone's liking. A small asteroid named 2020 VT4 got closer to our planet than all others have ever done. In November 2020, 
it flew over the Pacific Ocean at an altitude a bit smaller than the distance from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. That space rock was about the size of a big car. If it did make it to Earth's atmosphere, it would burn up completely before touching the ground. Falling asteroids and meteorites aren't uncommon on our planet. Luckily, most of them burst into flames and burn up before they enter the atmosphere. Mars is to blame for such frequent meteor showers. The planet isn't far from the main asteroid belt in the solar system. Sometimes, the gravitational pull of the red planet grabs asteroids from there. Then, Mars spins them around and flings them in our direction, just like a slingshot. So, Mars is a bully. <laughs> Good thing we're protected by Jupiter. It's the largest planet in our solar system, and it has an incredibly strong gravitational field. It keeps the asteroid belt in line and protects us from being constantly hit by a rain of meteorites. And that's good news, considering Ceres is in the asteroid belt. This enormous space rock is so big that it was once considered to be a planet. Then, for many years, scientists called Ceres an asteroid. But in 2006, it was finally classified as a dwarf planet. This space object contains a third of the total mass of the asteroid belt, which is about 4% of the Moon's mass. If Earth were as large as a nickel, Ceres would be about the size of a poppy seed. So, what if an asteroid several miles across was heading toward our planet and people had to stop it? Well, we could break the space rock into smaller pieces. A massive explosion could be used to do this. People wouldn't even need to land on the giant asteroid. Getting close to its surface would be enough. Boom! A powerful burst of energy would split the asteroid into several large pieces and tons of debris. The smallest rocks would burn in the heat released in the blast, and it would also change the asteroid's trajectory. The larger fragments would burn up while entering the atmosphere. All witnesses of this unusual meteor shower would have a chance to admire a beautiful fire show. Another means of protection could be a kinetic battering ram. Simply put, it would be a huge object that people would send towards the asteroid approaching Earth. Or it could be a heavy spaceship. This is the method scientists produce to prevent the asteroid Apophis from falling to Earth. This guy is 1,200 feet across and often passes by our planet, coming as close as 19,000 miles above Earth's surface. The asteroid is going to pass close to our planet again in 2029. And there is a possibility that in 3036, it might crash into the Earth. If it happened, the explosion would leave a crater more than 3 miles across. Within 6 miles of the impact zone, all buildings and subway tunnels would be crushed or severely damaged. The event would also trigger a powerful earthquake. In the area of 30 miles away from the crater, car windows and window panes in houses would be shattered. And 75 miles away from the impact site, the earthquake would move furniture and buildings. One way to stop such a catastrophe is to build a heavy spaceship. It would take off from Earth, speed up, and then ram into the asteroid with great force. This impact would alter the course of the huge space rock, and it would fly past our planet. We could also try to stop the asteroid by wrapping it in foil. This would make its surface reflective, and then solar pressure might gradually change the asteroid's trajectory. Another alternative is using the gravitational tug. In this case, we would send an unmanned spaceship, large and heavy, toward the asteroid. It would fly over the space rock and slowly draw the thing closer with its gravitational pull. A small change, of course, would be enough to make the asteroid fly past our planet. Another way to protect Earth would be to build a system of giant lenses in space. Perhaps you've tried focusing sunlight with eyeglass lenses. Then you know how hot this sunlight can get. Now imagine having many giant lenses that are all directed at one point. Scientists think that focusing such a powerful beam of light on the asteroid would make the rock melt and evaporate, slowly changing its route. And one more way to protect ourselves from the asteroid would be to install several rocket engines on its surface. It would turn the space object into a rocket, and we could set its course from Earth. Rogue stars pose a much bigger danger. Like asteroids, they fly through space and can collide with anything in their path. The problem is that they have a gigantic mass, sometimes comparable to our suns. Around 70,000 years ago, 
a duo of rogue stars whooshed past the Sun. It didn't affect Earth, but caused some disturbance on the outskirts of the solar system. This event is likely to happen again, someday. The rogue star Gliese 710, about half the mass of our Sun, is moving toward our solar system right now. There's a possibility that it'll begin to grab asteroids from the outer asteroid belt and toss them at us. And then, rare meteor showers you can observe these days will become a regular occurrence. But right now, this rogue star is extremely far from our world. And there's a bigger chance that it'll pass by without affecting our peaceful existence.